bulletin says James chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. All because I failed to notify Rachel when she made the bulletin that that's not where the sermon's coming from. So second, if you take your Bibles and turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 4, we're going to look at something else today. And, and I, of course, we, we want to honor and recognize and acknowledge the, the impact that, that mothers have and, and recognize the ladies, especially those of us who... who fondly consider how we were raised, and some of you I know may have had different memories of, of mom, and we don't want to, to, to hurt anybody's feelings. Some of you may wish that you had been a mom, wish that you were one. You know, uh, we won't get into too many questions of that, but we do recognize and acknowledge that you know, being a mother is tough work. Uh, I was reminded of that again this week because mom came to visit for a couple of days and you know, she reminded me that I was tough work, so y'all can just keep that in mind. But uh, we, we do appreciate, ladies, those of you that have an impact and that help hold up and, and guide and, and strengthen uh, those of you that are that are mothers in, in, in the flesh and those that are mothers also in the spirit and the faith for those around us. We do thank you for that and we do appreciate that. And now that I've done with that, I hope you found 2 Kings chapter 4. And if you would stand with me in honor of reading God's Word, we're going to look at a little story here that we remember from kid church, but may not have thought about lately. 2 Kings chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. Now a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, Your maidservant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Then he said, Go borrow vessels at large for yourself from all your neighbors, even empty vessels. Do not get a few. And you shall go in and shut the door behind you and your sons and pour out into all these vessels, and you shall set aside what is full. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons, and they were bringing the vessels to her, and she poured when the vessels were full, she said to her son, Bring me another vessel. And he said to her, There is not one vessel more. And the oil stopped. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debt, and you and your sons can live on the rest. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray, Lord God, that you will speak to our hearts through it today. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now, as we look at this, first let's deal with some facts of the passage. Some things that you need to know and that you need to understand. So a certain woman comes and she is of the wives of the sons of the prophets. And if you don't know what the biblical phrase in the Old Testament, the sons of the prophets, mean, you'll think that, well, she married Elisha's son because he's a prophet and this is the sons of the prophets. But really and truly, in the Old Testament times, there were the big prophets that we have the names for, people like Isaiah, Elijah, and Elisha. And then we have the sons of the prophets, and these are the lesser known, not quite as famous preachers. That's really who they were. Uh, they're the guys that went out and they did, they, the, the sons of the prophets, they're the ones who went out on behalf of the prophets, for example, and, and preached and taught and, and spread God's word. For example, if Elisha had had a message to send to a little small town in Israel, but he didn't have time to go, he would send one of the sons of the prophets. And that's who these guys are. They show up from time to time, especially in the life of Elijah and Elisha. They are the sons of the prophets. And they show up. That's what they do. That's who they are. So this is not the biological descendants of the prophets. These are the spiritual descendants of the prophets. And the first principle that I want you to take from the passage, from this passage and from this today, is that not all parenting is physical. Not all parenting is physical. Sometimes the parenting that you do is spiritual. And it has to do with those that you teach and those that you encourage and those that you strengthen. Elisha was not the father of all the sons of the prophets. But they treated him as if he was. They become known as the sons of the prophets. Not all the parenting that you do is, is, is physical. In fact, someone can be... We have no evidence, for example, that Elisha had any offspring at all. You can be a, be a father figure. You can be a mother figure without ever having a child of your own. It's a matter of what do you choose to do with your time and with your effort. 
And as we serve God, one of the things that we should find is that there are people that we invest in, that we, that we share with, that we encourage and we strengthen that come after us. They can become known as our sons and our daughters. So as you consider today and as you consider Mother's Day, the thing that you should consider is first of all that there are people that have been in your life who are not biologically related to you or perhaps I know that this is a small town and it's actually kind of hard sometimes to find people that aren't biologically related to, to folks. There's only a, a handful of us that, that, are, that, that are here that aren't related to at least somebody else in the room. But, think about the people that have influenced you, people, the people that have taught you, the people that have encouraged you, the people that have helped you become the person that you are. And consider the debt and the gratitude that you owe to them, and then consider this, who are you that person for? One thing that takes a moment to stop and remember to, to, to stop and think about before we draw to is the fact that for many of us we think, well, it's not my time yet to be that kind of person. There's still this person that... Some of you are older than you admit. You're old enough. You say, no, I'm not. I'm still... Oh, wait. I'm in my 20s, my 30s, my 40s. It's time for you to realize that you have an influence on other people. It's time for you to realize, even though you're a teenager, that there's four and five and six-year-olds that are staring at you going, ooh, I'm going to be like her. Oh, I'm going to be like him. Because full-size grown-ups are still kind of scary. And no, you don't have a child yet, but you have people that are following after you who are striving to be just like you. How are you using that influence? But she comes and she has a crisis. Her first crisis is this. She no longer has a husband. She has become a widow. She is now a single mother. And she has no income and she has nothing. She says, the creditor is coming to take my children and set my two sons and sell them into slavery to satisfy my debt. The unspoken reality of this is that after her two sons are taken and sold to satisfy her debt, she'll still have nothing. She'll be a widow with no children, with no one to care for her, with no one to look after her. She faces a challenge. What am I going to do? How do I do this? I can't bear the thought of losing my children, but I also don't know what happens after this happens. After I lose them, I've got nothing. No one to care for me. No one to provide for me. I have nothing. I'll starve to death. That's the reality that she is facing. That she will starve to death. That she will. That, she, that, will, that will be the end of her and her husband's line. That will be it. What do I do? <clears throat> we face those kinds of crises from time to time. What do we do? I don't have any... I, I don't have any ideas. Our debt is so great that we can't, you know, we'll never pay this off. You know, we had to mortgage, we had to mortgage the yard to pay for the house, mortgage the house to pay for the yard, and it's all just looped around. We've got nothing. We don't quite see where the next next pile of groceries that will fill the cabinet are coming from. We don't have this and we don't have that. What do we do? And on top of that, the people that we ask for help are not people that can help us. She asks Elisha, and at that first question, well, what would you have me do? Basically, Elisha's statement is, I don't have anything to give you to pay off your creditors. We all find ourselves frequently in the same boat. We've got nothing, and so do all, all of our friends. We don't have a way to get ourselves out of our own problems, and it may not be a financial problem. It may be an employment problem. Well, I'd hire you if I had work to give, but I can't find work for myself. Well, I'd help you with this, but I don't, I don't, have, I don't know how to fix it. Now, some of you might be able to say, well, now, you know, if you come to me with that problem, I could have fixed it. I could say, no, I've got a lawnmower that doesn't work. I've got to push 
mower and it it doesn't crank. And I could take it to some of y'all and you'd look at it and say, yep, you're right, your lawnmower doesn't start. And all we can do is huddle around and go, well, uh, because small engine repair is not necessarily everybody's forte. I took it apart yesterday, cleaned the one thing that, that uh, I thought was wrong with it. It still doesn't work. That's okay. Don't really need it. It's not that critical. Folks, if the biggest problem you have this week is that your lawnmower won't start, I assure you, you've had a good week. Unless you're in the lawnmower business. And it's another story. We go to people to solve our problems and they can't fix them. What would you have me do? He said, stop and consider. What have you got? And folks, that is a question I think that the Lord puts in front of us. The prophet here speaks the word of the Lord and says, what have you got? You look at your problems and you look at your struggles and your difficulties, whether they are material or they're emotional or they're spiritual or they're in your relationships or they're at your job. And the first question you need to ask yourself is, what have I got? This is a frequent question throughout Scripture. This is the same question that God gives to Moses when Moses stands before the burning bush and says, says to God, I can't do this. And God says to him, well, what have you got in your hand? He says, well, it's just a stick. The prophet Elisha asks the woman here, what have you got at home? Well, I've got a jar of oil. Probably a jar of olive oil. Could be a jar of various other... We're pretty sure it wasn't soybean oil. They didn't grow soybeans back then, sorry. But she's got a jar of cooking oil. That's it. What have you got? You need to stop and ask yourself as you face a crisis today, what have I got? What do I have? Do I have <coughs> this? Do I have that? I mean, all I've got is a stick and a jar of oil. Well, with Moses, all he had was a stick. That, that didn't accomplish much, did it? He went down, stood before Pharaoh with, a, with that staff in his hand. That staff that turned into a snake and ate the other snakes. That staff that he held out over the Red Sea and the Red Sea parted. That staff that he leaned on for 40 years as he led the people of Israel. What have you got? I don't know what you've got. You may say, I don't have much. I know certain things, though, that I'm certain that you have. You have 168 hours a week. I know that you have 168 hours a week because that's what 7 times 24 is. You have 168 hours a week. What do you do with them? How do you spend them? I know that you at least have one set of clothing because you've got it on while you're here today, and I thank you for that. I know that you have the ability to get yourself from one place to the other because not a one of y'all lives in this building. And you may have gotten here by walking, you may have gotten here by driving, somebody may have had to pick you up. But you've got some abilities. Some of you have got more education than others. Some of you have specialized education. Some of you have got this, you've got that. What have you got? You say, well, I don't have much. All I have is that I like to do this or I can do that. So start there. What do you have? Consider what you've got available to you. Well, I, I only have this and this. So use it. Pray and ask God. Take some of that 168 hours and carve yourself off 30 minutes a day to put that time into praying that God would show you how to use everything else that you've got. <clears throat> Take that 168 hours, take three and a half of them, and say, Lord, how do I use the other 164 and a half hours that I have? What have you got? How can you use it? Now, that may require a little bit of sacrifice. We don't know what she intended to do with this oil. She may have been planning on going home and making pancakes. We don't know. She may have had other intentions for it. You may have to say, Lord, what should I do with all this? And you may find that some of the things that you fill your time with have to be cast aside. 
You may have to cast aside some things that, that, are, that are your favorite habits, that are your favorite ways to spend your time, because the Lord says, if you do this, this will be better. You may be spending your time and your energy and your effort on the things that destroy you instead of build you up. Your time and your energy and your effort may be going into things that, that cause strife within your marriage and within your home. And you need to put those aside. But I challenge you, take three and a half hours out of the week and say, Lord, how do I spend the other 164 and a half? You say, three and a half hours sounds like a lot. 30 minutes a day. I don't have 30 minutes a day. Are you sure you don't have 30 minutes a day? Stop and think about it. You may not have it at the beginning of the day. You may have to be at work at 5 in the morning and you can't get up 30 minutes earlier. I understand. But consider this. How's the rest of the day spent? You spend that 30 minutes before you go to bed. Lord, how do I spend tomorrow? Far better than not spending it at all. What do you have in your hand? She says, this is all I've got. He says, okay. Well, here's what you do. Go, gather jars from everybody that you can find, and start pouring out. He said, I don't have much. I don't have a whole lot of time. I don't have a whole lot of energy. I don't have a whole lot of, of, of education, or, or I don't have any money, or I don't have any skills, or... Yes, you do, first of all. Many of you have skills and, and abilities that you tend to, to push down and say, well, I'm really not that good with that. You're better than you think you are. He says, go and find a way to, to store this. Find things to do with this. Find vessels to pour oil into. Take your time and your energy and your effort and pour it into, whatever, into what you can find that you're suited for, that glorifies and honors God. Take that time, put that time into prayer, and say, Lord, how do I use this? She pours out the oil into vessels, and they just keep filling up. Now, some people want to find an explanation for how God does every miracle that He does in Scripture. There are people that that is how they put their time and effort into Bible study. Say, okay, well, how did God do this? They look at Moses in the Red Sea, and they say, oh, well, there's times that the wind, if the wind blows hard enough, it can blow the ocean back. So that explains this. And there's times this could happen and this could happen. <coughs> Folks, there's not really much of an explanation to this. You've got a quart jar, you're pouring out of it, you fill up jar after jar after jar. There's not a natural explanation for this one. Olive oil does not multiply. I have, a, I have a, an olive oil bottle at home that's got about this much oil left in the bottom of it. I'm fairly certain when I get home from church today, it's going to have that much oil left in the bottom of it. And when I want more, I'm pretty sure that I'm going to have to go to the store and buy it. That doesn't fill up automatically. There's no natural process that that happens. The only explanation here is that in some way and in somehow God caused that to last. God caused that to expand. God caused there to be more there than people could imagine and that people could understand. God did it. And that's the explanation for every miracle in Scripture. You want to know why it happened? Because God did it. You say, I just have trouble with that. I don't, I don't believe things I can't see. Well, you know, at some point we have to get over that, that stubbornness in our hearts and say, I'm willing to believe that God is capable of doing amazing things. Because when we refuse to believe that God is capable of doing something so simple as making olive oil, then how in the world do we believe that God can change our lives and, and, and bring us closer to Him? Folks, if God is able to do this, then He's certainly able to do so much more. But far too often we want to say, well, He couldn't have done that. And as a result, we won't believe that He can do anything else. But I will tell you this, the Scripture tells us truthfully what God has done in the past, and we can rely on that to guide us in understanding what God will do. And if God can do something like this, God can work in our lives and bring amazing things to happen. God multiplies the oil, and when they reach a point that there's no more vessels, that's it. It stops. God provides perfectly and adequately the right amount that she needed in that time. 
God provides exactly what's needed and exactly the time in which it's needed and in the form in which it's needed. He gives her what she needs. Sometimes we face those moments where we come up against those challenges and those difficulties and we say, you know, if that had lasted, if I'd have had one more day of this, I wouldn't have made it. If I'd have had one more, you know, I'd, I'd have fallen apart. I'd still, you know, my strength was wearing out. Well, why do you think the Lord caused that trial to end at that point? He provided you the grace and the strength that you needed to get through that many days. He didn't provide you strength to get through a three-week trial when he gave you two, when, it, when it was a two-week two-week trial. Because you're not going to waste that extra week. You're going to need it later. Because you can only handle so much. For all we know, the number of vessels and jars that may have had the house completely stacked full, there wasn't any place else to put them. Or any neighbors left to borrow jars from. There's nothing left to be added. God provided the right amount in the right time and in the right way. And as you face a challenge and a difficulty, the, the frustrations going forward, mothers, especially mothers of small children who say, oh, I just can't, I don't know what I'm going to do. Fathers of small children, as you face the same thing, I don't know what I'm going to do. Realize God's going to provide just enough. Enough patience, enough, frustra enough frustration to build your patience and enough grace to get through those days. God provides. He provides for her, but at that point, she's not quite sure what to do. You know what? There's times that we have crises and we don't know what to do. And we're pretty good when we have a problem. We're good to come to the Lord and say, God, what do I do? I don't know how to handle this. The next thing she does is another part of what we need to learn to do as God's people, and that is this. She now has an overabundance. And she doesn't know what to do. We sometimes think that, well, if I've got enough, then I'll, I'll figure it out. If I have enough, then I, I won't have to, to, to pray. If everything work, When everything's working, I don't have to pray. But she does the right thing here. She's got a house full of olive oil. <coughs> So what should she do? But she doesn't try to figure that out. She goes back to the prophet and says, what do I do now? And he says, sell it. Now I would think that what she ended up doing is sending her son back to the people that they had borrowed jars from and said, would you like to buy this jar full of oil? They said, well, what do you, well, typically a jar like this full of oil would sell for, you know, 10 denarii, but I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll give you the jar and we'll sell you the oil for just six. Yeah, What's my jar in the first place? Well, exactly. Or do you want us to, you know, rent your jar to somebody else and get the jar back? And it's empty. I don't know how it worked out, but if the prophet tells her, sell it, sell the oil, you and your sons can you can pay off your debt and live on all the rest. This is a provision for her for the rest of her years until her sons are old enough to take care of her. We don't know how old they were at the time. Suffice it to say, this is probably enough. What he's telling her is if she goes and sells it, there will be enough for several years of survival. Until her sons are old enough to go out and get a job, begin to work, begin to be able to provide for their mother as they're supposed to. Because that's the way society worked then. It's not all that bad of a way for society to work now. They provided, it provided enough which would have been much more than anyone would have expected. When we face challenges and difficulties, when we face trials and frustrations, we need to consider what have we got available to us? What has God given us? What has God provided us? How can we use that for His glory? When we face challenging days, we need to ask that question. How can we use this? Because when we get to the end of this story, one of the interesting things about it is we never know the woman's name. We don't know her son's names. 
We don't know anything about them, to be honest, other than this one moment. But we do remember what God did. One of the glorious and amazing things that we see across history is the number of times that people were able to accomplish amazing things to, to, to glorify God. And those people that go down in history anonymously. We don't remember all the people that were involved in starting the churches that we go to. We don't remember all the people. Some of you do, do remember the names of almost all the preachers that you've ever had. Some of us don't remember that. We don't remember the names of all, all the Sunday school teachers that we've ever had. We probably ought to. But it's hard to remember all of them. We don't remember all the teachers that we had in school. We don't remember all the, the, the godly influences and the friends and the, the friends' parents and everyone else that pointed us to Jesus along the way. But I will tell you this, if we're worried about being remembered, we're worried about the wrong thing. We need to be worried about pointing people back to the one whose grace brought us this far in the first place. We as parents, those of you who have that, that joyous responsibility, oftentimes we wonder, well, I hope, I hope my kids still like me when, I'm, when, when they're grown and hope that they remember us well and, and all these types of things. But you know, that's not really your goal as a parent. Your goal as a parent is to raise your children to walk with Jesus. And it may be that there will come that time that that's what they do. And they may not exactly do it the way that we want them to. <coughs> but that's the call on our lives. That's the challenge ahead of us. And when we do that, we'll see God begin to work in people. We'll see Him pour out His blessings. Spiritual, earthly, Measurable and immeasurable. Because that's what he does. When people are willing to come to him, whether it's out of their crisis or out of their abundance, and say, Lord, what do we do next? And walk in obedience. That's my challenge to you today. As you go into this week, take that time. Submit it to the Lord and say, God, how can I use it? And see what he does to multiply what you have left to accomplish amazing things. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to be here in this place. We thank you, Lord, for your work. We pray, Lord God, that you'll help